on the west or the east coast yeah we're going everywhere today i'm travis stevens uh welcome to butcher bird presents today we are doing a very special butcher bird presents where we are interacting with the sterable.com community and they ask me anything i'm here with fellow butcher and filmmaker stephen calcote say hello to everyone stephen hello everyone in tv land out there across yeah. the world and i want to say um good late evening to victor wong in hong kong, hong kong. who watches these as well yeah. so it, it's worldwide 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 we are seriously worldwide wide right now um so listen, we have something that we've never done before. We are taking our Butcher Bird Presents feed that usually goes only to our, our Facebook audience, you know, our moms and aunts or whoever's tuning Absolutely. in out there. Uh, and we are embedding that via YouTube today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're actually dual streaming to Facebook and to YouTube and then embedded link on Starable via our YouTube Live. So. All of the questions that are going through the Sterable.com website are coming to us, and then our answers are going back out via video, uh, the, the world of technology, to the Sterable.com website. And our local moderator, we should say, is Lillian diaz Prisbel, who is another veteran of the show, and um, she'll, she'll keep us straight and narrow as we answer questions so as well. So if you see us kind of dumbly staring kind of right next to camera, it's, it's us. It's probably actually, just us. Yeah. It's actually it's and, just who we are. And I'll bust out the old man glasses and be like, oh, okay, beautiful. So uh, kind of without further ado, I would like to say that I'm really, really excited about today's episode because it is interacting with the DIY indie filmmaker webisode kind of community who is uh, very interested in the things that are, we are very interested in. And this specific uh, platform and our workflow today is built around that spirit. And full disclosure, neither you nor I went to film school. Absolutely nope. everything that we have learned has either been making it up the best we could, learning from it on set, uh, talking to mentors in the industry. So we, I would say, are still in an ongoing film school, if you will, yeah. for our lives. Yeah, uh, never stop learning, never stop experimenting, never stop reaching out to, to mentors and relationships. And, and those really are the, the kind of key things that I want everyone to, to take away from this AMA because if you ask me anything, those are probably the answers I'm going to come up with, I think. Very good. Yeah. Um, do you want to talk through just uh, the tech of this, you know, and just kind of hang a lantern on what we're doing today, I think is, is a really good example of the spirit around here, which is when we've never done anything before, when we don't have answers to how to do it, we what find the next? answers, That's right. Absolutely. We, we make it up. If there's not an answer out there, sure. we make an answer. And you know, we learn from our experimentation. That's why we were like so excited to do this. It's like, oh, we've never done this before. How do you do it? How I do you, don't know, how do you let's link, figure it out. How do you link into a live AMI with a com uh, AMA with a completely different site, right? So to give you guys, uh, Griffin, can we switch to the dark side? Can we go to the dark side? Actually, we are not doing the dark side today. Oh, we're we're staying on the light side, but we can, light we can side. talk about the dark uh, side. Talk about the dark side. I so want to go call, over and grab a camera and like flip it over. And yeah, see. we call the dark side. Um, actually, if you want to do that now, you could actually swing um, one of these cameras over and show behind there. So uh, what Travis is doing right now is he's taking one of our set cameras here and he's gonna flip it over and give you a look at the behind the scenes production. So this is our live crew right now. Um, Jared is directing, he's the one standing. Griffin, we've got Mike on playback, Lillian on the cul-de-sac, I'm sorry, Lillian on the terrible questions and then we've got Adam at the far end and some kind of sports team hat. I couldn't possibly save my life, uh, but he is going to do the cul-de-sac, which is where we monitor QA and make sure that everything is uh, coming through to you guys out there in television land great. So um, as Travis gets back here, the reason he hung a lantern on this is because we didn't do this as a million dollar satellite broadcast. We said, okay, it's the means of production in the hands of the artist, finally, to be a little Marxist about it. And we said, okay, if we wanted to make a world-class live show, what would we do? Here's the good news. For the last two years, Facebook, YouTube, Vimeo, and the big players have made it possible for anybody on the planet pretty much to live stream. We wanted to take our professional filmmaking background and say, okay, let's take that fact, add our professional cameras into it, 
put the pieces together on a pretty small footprint yeah. and very modest budget to make it happen. So here's the learning from that. We didn't take no for an answer. It, it, we, we, didn't, we didn't take this idea that big multicam live streaming is, is something that only the big kids do. We said, all right, there's probably a way to do that because the technology and the distribution mechanism exists. We weren't afraid to make mistakes. Right, which actually brings us to the whole reason that Butcher Bear Presents exists in the first place. Right, right, um, because we uh, found that we had a lot of the kit around, a lot of the tech that was available. We saw this as a direction that we kind of felt like, you know, the industry might be going towards things like this. And we were like, well, you can do that. Just like with filmmaking, like, we well, can do that. You know, I don't need to ask permission if I do it myself, you know, and that's, that's, that's the kind of the theme thing. for being a filmmaker today of any kind is you don't need to ask permission anymore. There is a way to do it. And that kind of gets into really the first question that we have from, from Brie over at the Sterable.com website, which is... Good morning, good afternoon, Brie. Yeah, hi. She says, my standard first question is always, how did you get into filmmaking and into web series in particular? For us, filmmaking was that drive and passion for the kind of the creative end. But also for me, it was... Um, doing it myself because I didn't want to ask permission. And uh, we are at a time when the digital tools over the last 10 years have, you know, started to flourish first with, you know, what cameras were available and they weren't great, you know, but the little three chip cameras, you know, the Canon uh, XL1 and then the Canon XL2, those were my first cameras. Uh, you know, the uh, Final Cut Pro before they kind of shit the bed. <laughs> Can I say that? Uh, Don't worry, we'll bleep it out later. Uh, um, you know, bringing uh, a suite of online uh, uh, editing tools that I could start putting these things and really learning the craft of filmmaking from the ground up, you know? I want to go to, um, I think, the core of Bree's question. All this fits into that. Uh, if you were to go to the moment where we said, oh, let's do a web series, yeah. I'll give you a specific example. It was artist-driven. Yeah. It was basically... Yeah. An artist had an idea that 10 years ago, you would have had network executives okaying at first. And right. the artists were Yuri Lowenthal and Tara Platt. And they had come up with this really zany idea about tiny action figures coming to life and what would really happen. Not the G-rated Toy Story version, but the, you would go crazy if you were stuck as a action figure on a young boy's shelf. You would just go nuts, right? And all the psychoses and insaneness that was shelf life, this story of a live action set of kids toys. And Yuri and Tara um, had kicked off a series and they wanted to um, try to really expand it and try a lot more things. And right. so- uh, So they had done season one. Right, and they had just said, let's try this and let's get it out there. Let's right. get the characters out there and, and see what we learn. And then after the lessons of season one, they're like, okay, let's bring in some other friends of ours that do this. And one of the great thing about Yuri and Tara is that they're fearless. Fearless, which is fearless. important. They will Be try fearless. anything and everything. But it's, it's that pure idea of, we have this crazy story, we have this fun idea, let's, let's put it on its legs and see if we can get a fan following, get a fan base, get people interested. Yeah, yeah, so it's really, really from the ground up DIY. And so, um, you know, when we start doing kind of our DIY stuff, and we'll touch on this for like the feature film that we ended up doing and stuff like that, a lot of what we do is we take a, uh, we have our creative idea and then we kind of take a roll call of what assets do we have available? What locations do we have available? And like create the perimeter of the sandbox that we're playing. It's in. the old Robert Rodriguez note, right to what you have available. Yeah. It's, it's reverse engineer out of, oh, you're in Cincinnati, Ohio and an uncle owns a diner. Well, that diner closes at some time. Yeah. So from, 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., you can shoot in a diner for four hours. So write something to yeah, that. Yeah, so, so that's kind of the first axiom, right? It's the first axiom. Write to what you have. Right. And so Yuri and Tara, they had a lot of uh, amazing kind of actor friends that mm -hmm. were willing to jump into the pool and do this zany stuff. And they had a location where they could build a shelf. 
And so... And they could keep a standing set in basically a studio apartment studio. Yeah. Yeah, it was so small, so cramped. And then we just started exploring the, uh, the, the possibilities. And so I would love to do a throw to kind of my favorite of the first DIY episodes that we were involved in. And that was one where we got off the shelf for the first time. But it followed the rule. Yuri and Tara challenged us to get off the shelf, yep. which where all of season one was. And they said, how do we get off the shelf? And you amongst us had a house. And we said, well, what if this house were the boy's house? Yeah. And so that was another thing that was available. And we said, okay, what can we do to make the house really come alive? Yeah. So, um, so without further ado. Yeah, yeah Mike, why don't, why don't you play that back and we'll show TV land out there what it looked like. your mind? Where would we park a pink Corvette? Whoa! So it. fun, so fun. So <clears throat> I think that's an example of kind of our earliest web series kind of uh, endeavor at that point. And we uh, really embraced a couple of things, which is what's new is old as new, for lack of a better way of putting it. So um, when you first did that snake episode of him s stealing Barbie's dream car, like one of the things that I really loved was you creating a process screen out of a computer screen. You were like, you took on the challenge of a filmmaker. I really want to be able to, to um, get the experience of jumping inside the car with him. How am I going to do that? And we didn't have any money. We didn't have anything. You know, we just, all you had was a couple of dolls, a, a Barbie dream car <laughs> and your computer and you still made it happen. Right, and we actually went back to how it was done in the, in the past, in the 1950s with process screen driving yeah. films. We said, well, how would we recreate that today? I think part of that is a fearlessness yeah. about saying, well, there's no reason we shouldn't try this. Uh, Lillian was just reminding us that we have more questions uh, popping up. Um, do you wanna uh, pop to another one? Uh, sure, right now, what uh, is uh, from Meg, uh, what's your guys' actual business setup? Are you a studio space or a production company or a content company or what? What does Butcher Bird Studios do? Yes, uh, yes. the answer is yes. <laughs> That's the answer laughing. is yes. So, um, you know, we started a couple, three or four years ago. Uh, you know, I was working in a warehouse, like loading tables into trucks. And we decided that we wanted to start a, a, a production company because we had kind of dreams or aspirations beyond truck loading or whatever each of our individual partners was doing. And we had and, a- And to be clear, we, we had all had the pleasure of working together on each other's yeah. projects, right? And we knew that 
we liked working with each other and we wanted to make more films stronger right. together. And, and we found a group of people that do, right? We were all directing stuff, no matter what, no excuses. And no matter what was going on or like the, the kind of brutality of the relentlessness of life, we found a group of like individuals that were doing things no matter what the challenges were kind of being thrown at us. We're like, these are the type of people I want to go into business together. And so, we identified uh, revenue streams, right? So what do we do? We do everything that helps us kind of pay the bills. So we service client uh, projects. We create our own IP. Uh, we, I don't know. We, um, we, I would provide a foundation. Um, so an answer to the question about what is Butcher Bird, we're sitting inside of our studio space, um, which is a main stage white psych. Next to this, if you were to walk out the door here, is our uh, house slash office. Where we have about eight of us doing a wide variety of everything from corporate videos and documentaries to music videos yeah. to pilots to basically the full suite of um, agency slash production company services. Right. And, you know, from my perspective, uh, when I was kind of setting up the infrastructure, that helped us exist. One of my main goals was to whittle away at the overhead. All too often, uh, you know, I went and talked with young production companies, whether they had capital investment or not, and you get so eager. You want to go out and get the stuff that helps you do your stuff. And I was like, okay, what do we need to do to put into place that helps us exist while paying for itself. So I went out and started exploring the relationships that we had in play. And that's kind of another axiom that we live by, which is uh, if you do not have money to do something. Then relationships are your relationships wealth. Relationships are the other way. Relationships this, this, are your wealth. This town operates on Money and relationships. We don't have money, we have great relationships. And so when we do things, um, uh, when we do things, we find out who our partners are. And those partners are the people that are operating camera for you. Those partners are the people that are in front of camera for you. Those people are, are the people that are you know, building your sets or letting you film at their locations. And I cannot stress this enough. Relationships make the world go round. And you have to find not just how those relationships can help you, but you can help them. It has to be a two-way street. Like, we are friends, honest to God friends, that make our business possible. And if it were not for them, if it were not for the Nick Novotny's or, or Joe Marines or, you know, uh, uh, Stephen Moreno's or any other of the 10,000 people that I could give a shout out to, if it were not for them, you know, the William Hadley's, the, gosh, I don't even start naming names because there's too many of them. We, we, we exist, wouldn't exist. We exist because of them. And it's this wonderful, um, mutually beneficial ecosystem where they're working on our projects and we work on their projects. Yeah. So uh, that's the big answer to what is Butcher Bird. It's specifically a uh, content production studio for companies, agencies, etc. But it's also a creative, collaborative powerhouse yeah. that brings a lot of artists together. Yeah. Uh, Jay Caster, uh, Jamie Lancaster. Hi Butcher Bird, love the ethos of not wanting to ask permission. It's big here in the web series world. What's your advice for total newbie filmmakers to make great things, especially if, like you guys, we didn't go to film school? I love that question. Yeah. I love it. What is it? Find, find your resources. Find your resources. Like, what do you have available? Like, right. you know, I mean, lights, camera, action, right? Right. <laughs> right? So, what do you have materially to support your dream of being a filmmaker? Sure. Uh, who are the people that are willing to jump in? Because, like, listen, We've all heard the stories about uh, there's too many gatekeepers, too many people say no, right? And I get it. Everybody says no. I don't want to. I don't want to hear about that. I want to hear about the people that say yes. And then the people that say yes, what 
can you do? Like, what can you do? In, in short, for me, web series are the new, they're the new proving ground. Yeah. So it's not that your web series is going to get you the direct filming next Star Wars gig. It's, do I take you seriously as somebody who actually does things, right? Who right. actually, as you said, is a doer. And I, I want to share with you something that I say to clients now. And I pull out my film, my, my filmmaking tool, my iPhone in this case, and I right. say, everybody's a filmmaker. Yeah. And to answer your question directly, Jamie, if you have a phone with a camera on it, that is all you need to make your first web series. I, seriously, it is, if this is all you had and you could afford, or, you know, something like this, then you could write a web series where you had characters close enough to the camera and the microphone, and then use free editing software online. That is the baseline today. Right. And in fact, you're competing against thousands of people across the planet who this is their camera and it's good enough to pick up dialogue and it's good enough to film two people talking and there's a story. So that's my advice is find the best camera you have if you're getting into web series and start making a show that's designed around that. And, and I don't mean to be reductive at all because you should know that we've started cutting in iPhone footage to a lot of our projects for clients, et cetera, because it's the phone that we always have with us yeah. no matter what. Yeah, and they're becoming better and better. And I think to kind of riff on that, find out what your blocks are. And I think all too often, the block that people run into is this idea of quality or perfection. Mm -hmm. And I want to get away from that. Like if you're going to strive for perfection in the first thing that you do, you are never going to do anything. Strive for completion. Strive for finishing. The people that we started to get in business with are the people that made a name for themselves within our kind of friend group for finishing the things that they started. And I cannot stress that enough. You Flakiness is bread and butter in Hollywood. Well, and, and here, here's a raw truth. Hollywood is littered with unfinished projects and yeah. you don't get credit for the project you didn't finish. Yeah. The, the primary mission when you're starting out should be to finish it, learn from it, and move on. And take that group of people that you started with and the actors and the script lessons and write the next one. Yeah, and, and then from there, uh, give an honest quality assessment of what you did create and don't be afraid to like take notes. Like so too often, I, and I'm guilty of this, when I first kind of started my artistic endeavors or my business endeavors, I wanted to sit back and appreciate the things that I created, right? And so I was really nervous about like that note taking process. Right. Like, what? I wanna be Amadeus. Why can't everybody understand my genius, right? And that's not the process. The process is to take those notes. You still have your filter on what you're gonna, you're gonna do or not do, what you're gonna take in, what supports your overall vision or doesn't, but you need to learn to take those notes, find the people that you trust that give the notes that you need, and keep raising that quality bar higher and higher. Amen. Finish it first. Aim for quality on the next one. What's your better process? Ollie R. People give the use your phone advice a lot, but is that enough? No. Why bother releasing something that isn't as good as it could be? What's the point of that? Or do you just mean we should make stuff, never show it, then eventually lead to a product you want to release? Well, I would actually, I would say my point was not that you're doing something on the iPhone that is not releasable. My point was the iPhone is good enough if that is all you have available to create something with. And I, and I say that having seen pieces done on iPhones. Yeah. Tangerine, the movie, is often held up as an example. Yeah. But um, I would say that you always wanna make something that's releasable. And YouTube, as a proving ground, that is the bar you should, you should aim for, yeah. make it releasable. Now, obviously, you don't wanna stay in iPhone land forever, right? Mm -hmm. You wanna try to find a way to save up for that next level up, right? But, but keep in mind that eBay is your friend here. You can get an HD camera on eBay for under $100 if you want something that has a little built-in zoom lens on it. Yeah. It's like you're always leveling up on the next thing. And, and here's the thing. 
if you're wanting to shine, if you're wanting to prove that people should look at you, it's doing the best version with what you have. So it's not empty advice at all to do it on an iPhone. And I would say another kind of add on to this is, listen, you know, invest in what moves the needle. And for me, if you're just starting out, everybody focuses on picture. Picture, 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 picture. And I'm gonna do a shout out to our audio friend, Ben Chan, mm -hmm. and say, if you want to lose your audience quicker than anything, bad sound, right? So as a indie web series, somebody coming in, focus on sound and not picture. Picture can be a style choice. Bad picture can be a style choice. Black and white, low res, whatever. You come with an artistic reason for why you're doing what you're doing. People, like in Kill Bill, Tarantino had like just black on the screen for like five minutes that had nothing but like sound overlaid to it as Uma Thurman was like buried in a coffin. Bad picture can be a style choice. Bad sound is always just bad sound. I want to <laughs> I want to amplify something off of the the web series doing whatever you can with the, the tools you have. Now, obviously, if you're J.J. Abrams and you do a web series that's not superlative in some way, it's going to be really strange, right? But if you're coming out to L.A. from I'll use Cincinnati as that example again, and you land here and it's like hey, I want you to see this thing I put together in Cincinnati. Here's what I'm gonna be looking for. What was the story? What was the dialogue? Was it interesting? And what did you do with the camera you had? Yeah. Was it dynamic? Did you come up with angles? Did you come up with shots that told the story in a, in a better way than just filming it straight on would have? I wanna be in a place, as I'm examining you, the new kid's material, where I say, wow, think of what this kid could do, and by kid it could be anyone from 10 to 80 who's right. just starting out, think what they could do if they had a better camera or a better lens. Better support, better, better support, etc. cetera. More professional people. So and, did, and you, did your story get out is, is really the standard that I'm talking about here. Did your story get out? And then I would also kind of play test that note taking thing because I'd want to understand their process. So like, are they uh, mature enough in their timeline to be able to come into a professional environment and take notes. And I gotta tell you, when you're working with clients, when you're, when you're not kind of living the Kubrick-esque, my vision, I am a cinematic god kind of thing, you're coming in, it means that you need to play well with others. It means that you need to be able to take those notes. Yep. And I want to kind of play test what that feels like. That's them. a good point. Once you're in the room, yeah. it's not just what your material was, but how you talk about your material and how open you are to improving. Yeah, which comes to, do you have any advice for working with friends? SL Jane, Jane, uh, I've done it before and sometimes mixing business with pleasure or social life doesn't work out well. Frowny face or side face. Okay, so listen, this, peer directing, peer managing. I don't care whether you're working at Pizza Hut or you're working in a film set. It is always hard. It is always hard. This is what I personally, because I'm, I am friends with a lot of, you know, most of the people that I work with. I don't have to be friends with them, but I happen to like kind of have a good filter and we have amazing people that work with us. I look for people that can not take it personally when we're doing that kind of work grind on pushback, I don't necessarily agree with this or whatever, I look for communication patterns. I look for people that can just talk. Just talk, throw out ideas, spitball things. This is right, this is wrong. I don't necessarily agree with this, but I don't necessarily need to be right all the time. I don't need to have my way all the time. I wanna give another perspective on this. Um, I think you're talking very much from the director's perspective of you're auditioning your friends for who's gonna be in this group of people that you're brought on and keep working with, and that's vitally important. I wanted to give some really uh, good examples from one of my favorite directors, Heather D. Michelle. She is the ultimate director who corrals friends into becoming a part of her productions. And if you walk onto a Heather D. Michelle set, she makes a warm, friendly environment where she's probably feeding people constantly. 
and she's having a good time yeah. and people feel like they're part of this this family we endeavor to do the same thing yeah. um heather's one of those directors where i've actually gotten to be on somebody else's set right, right. and so the point i'm making is if you bring friends in it's not just them proving that yeah. they can be on your set it's you doing everything you can to not make it work right. i mean to not make it feel like work right well and also on that kind of not make it feel like work that comes i think in valuing people's contribution to what you have going on listen if people are giving you time that is a gift cherish it time is the ultimate currency we only have so much time on this earth, all right? right? And if somebody is going, I value your you, and I value the kind of dream that you have going so forward. So this is the director saying to me, your crew member. Yeah, I'm saying to you, thank you. And I'm saying to you, thank you. And, and this is how I kind of cherish that, by being prepared, by having my fix it and prep done to the nth degree, by not wasting your time. when you. People step into our butcher bird kind of greater environment, the, and that's whether it's coming from you, from, from me, from you, from Jason, from Michael, from Lewis, any of the people that are involved in, envir in our environment. Most of the feedback from people that are coming in for the first time are like, oh my God, I've never m m walked into a space that was more methodically run. Everything seemed to run so smoothly. And that's not just because that's good for budget and everything else. It's because we're trying to honor our friends who are involved. Yeah, honoring the time. And so interestingly, having friends on a set requires more pressure or more responsibility yeah. to them. I'll say one more quick thing before we move on to the next one. If you were to get inside of our crewing and planning meetings for paid projects, because we do a lot of paid projects and we do a lot of volunteer projects, yeah. we're saying, of this big group of friends, who do we want to say, you've done a lot of volunteering for us, I want to promote you into a paid member of a big client project, or, or you know what, yes, we could work with X person again, but I want to give some love to this person who's yeah. given a lot to us. Yeah. Uh, and not to mention as well that a lot of those family volunteer gigs are auditioning crew members for yeah. the big cannot fail yeah. Intel project or Boeing or whatever it is, because that's a truth as well. So yeah. um, one more raw truth before I forget. If you're gonna work with your friends, the truth is not everybody is built for set life. And you just have to embrace that, right? You just have to embrace the fact that not everybody is going to be useful on a set. Figure that out very quickly. Say, thank you so much. And that's why, you know, it's not, it, this life isn't for everybody because it's a little cray cray, seriously. Yeah, value the people that actually tell you no. Hey, I need help on something. No. Not my thing. <laughs> Not my thing. Is so much better than, yeah, I'll help you, and then I don't show up, or and, I don't contribute in right. the way that I've kind of offered. And the positive thing there, the positive version of this is, we're looking for the people whose eyes light up when that crazy project comes up. Yeah. So Stephen Moreno, who's DPing um, my next piece, which is a sci-fi feature, his eyes bulged out cartoon-like and lit up when he said, DP or sci-fi feature, oh my God, yes. So, yeah, it sounds like fun. It sounds like fun, yeah. Uh, so I'm gonna completely tangent, go uh, off this topic, and uh, what we got? Go get outside, sounds interesting. Where did that idea come from? Jason Milligan, next. <laughs> <laughs> um, so go get outside is one of our things. So um, Mike, actually, uh, since we have things to throw to, for those of the people that are out there that don't know what Go Get Outside is, let's, uh, let's cue up a clip and give a little introduction to that. You ready for it? It definitely is an, an otherworldly environment. And it just doesn't get boring until the waves stop going to areas that the majority of the population won't ever see. I believe that anyone that can walk can be a hiker. I'm a surfer. Canyoneer. A hiker. And I'm a caver.
But if you make getting outside a priority in your life, then it'll happen. Go get outside. A very, very exciting project that came up from one of our partners, Jason Milligan. Who is our outdoors person. If he could, he would live outdoors doing adventure all over the world. So uh, the go-to here is, as far as web series go, find your passion. What drives you? You end up spending thousands of hours pouring through the minutia of this beast that you created. Right. And so Jason knew that he was an expert on lots of outdoor stuff, had met great people and said, you know what, I'm going to feature an outdoor project where I get to talk to these great people. And why did he do this format and how did it stand out? Jason realized something really important. He was not born independently wealthy. So he couldn't go super, super wide or super expensive on production, but he could go deep. He could find really interesting people and feature them in a way that they weren't getting featured elsewhere. So his premise for Go Get Outside is, these are people who are not superhuman. They have dedicated their lives to canyoneering or climbing or paragliding or whatever it is, but they are not the big sponsored Red Bull stars. In some cases they are, but for the most part, they are people that if you wanted to do what they're doing, you could do it. So, and this goes back to another kind of axiom, which is find the story and explore the possible. So for Jason, this actually started as a podcast. So when you- Audio only podcast. Audio only. And so when you sit there and you're talking about like, I only have an iPhone or I only have this or I only have that, eh, do something, create a body of work. And I don't care, take out all the excuses. I can't afford a camera, beautiful, make a podcast keep doing it and his podcast has kind of reached a level where now he's, he's actually, going to season four season four he's got people reaching out to him hey we'd like to sponsor you hey we'd like this or what like that when you create this body of work it starts building an inertia and the, and the payoff for jason is no matter how popular it is it's something he still loves he still, still loves wants it. to tell these stories and he gets to meet great people who inspire him and a lot of these people he stays in touch with. He does things with them still. He goes out and Kenyaneers and all the other fun things that he can do. And you take out the lights and the camera stuff, the mechanics of what you're doing, the interviewing and talking to people, the learning how to do a radio edit, the learning the back-end software of what it needs to do to kind of manipulate these things, create a show, be deadline-driven. All of those things apply to web series. All of those things. You do not get away from deadlines. You do not get away from, from finding a story. Those things fall true. I don't care if you got money or not. It happens everywhere. Stop every single yelling time. at me. I listen uh, to your advice. Uh. I listen. Uh, what web series have you worked on and in what capacities? What sets web series apart from other film formats in terms of development and production? Web series are a gift. Web series as a format is big television series for the rest of us. Yeah. It means that if you've got an idea, you can put, you can put it out there. There is a way to do it. That's, yeah. that's what web series represent to me. And to me, what web series have you worked on and what capacities is also the thing. I make a mean breakfast burrito. I know how to throw up lights. I've DP'd things, I've crafty, I don't care. I've acted in stuff. When you're talking about learning the craft, for me, that's an immersive thing and learn it all. You have to embrace running every role and knowing how to do every role. Support your friends, they'll support you and throw yourself into being the best, this part of the machine, this cog, that you can be. Take that part away. You want to be a good friend? You want to be a good, good contributor? Take that part of stress away from the person that's whose vision that you're supporting at that point. And if that means just making sure that everybody's fed, seriously, mean ass breakfast burrito. Right, which I, is coming handy. You know, uh, the, the two follow-ups on that are, you know, you and I did Shelf Life together and that was over 40 episodes <sighs> across four seasons. <sighs> Uh, we're entering into almost our 40th episode on Butcher Bar Presents, giving you that range from comedy all the way to nonfiction. The beautiful thing that's made it really worth it for us on both sides of those volunteer projects is that we've taken all that learning and put it into client work. So 
block shooting, um, efficient filmmaking, uh, keeping your crews and cast on the um, on the high energy level, right? right? So something very recently we did, we did this insane project for um, this ASMR food production. <laughs> QuickBooks sponsored, amazing entrepreneur <laughs> named Heidi. Heidi Salsa is her project. And nobody thought of it as a web series, but we created six individual ASMR sensory experience pieces about making super fresh salsa. That was a block shoot with all the same components that we did with web series. So I, I, it's a slightly unusual answer that I wanna really highlight is that web series is in a way the new film school for those of us who can't afford film school. If yeah. you treat it as real production, everything you learn there, everything you figure out there is gonna go into your client projects and, and your- And then to your bigger projects. Bigger projects. And this fall, I will start broadcasting a, a web series live experience that put together as a feature, but everything that we've learned on every one of the more than 100 episodes you and I have worked together across our different projects mm -hmm. is gonna go into that big funded project. And, or non-funded projects sometimes. Or non-funded sometimes, But sure. still big, and so to kind of, I'm gonna put a lid on this, throw to a question is how do you come up with the idea for Better Off Zed? So to get into that quick throw, Better Off Zed, uh, can we queue up the trailer so that people kind of get an idea of what we're talking about here? Independent feature film. Independent feature film, trailer for that. Uh, might Morning, be a playback for Better Off Zed. Morning, Bill. Morning, Fred. Morning, is Dia, Senior Gomez. Are you laughing? I'm getting so much sleep, I feel great. With all this creative energy. Please, can you wear clothes? At least wear pants, okay? It's all good. Okay, what about Mark? Look, he's not gonna get out, I promise. I'm not gonna sleep with him like that. Come on, trust me. Don't you fuck this up. I'm a jerk. I don't feel anything. It's like we're already just dead. There's no stress here. I mean, there's no mortgage, no bills. There's no debt. Student loans? Yeah, go on. This is the best thing that could have ever happened. We have plenty of water. We have oranges. And we've got electricity. This is about survival. We're into week three, and everything you see here, this is all we have left in the house. The death toll has yet to be determined, but current reports are sketchy due to the continuing spread of the outbreak. Pammy, there are 50 blocks of walking corpses between us and them. We don't even know if that place is still safe. This is safe. This is like winning the fucking lottery for you, isn't it? It's every man, woman, and child for themselves out there. And his world needs that now more than ever. He commands it. He condones it. Because if the world shall ever come back to it, if the world shall ever be whole again, if the world should be repopulated and civilization reborn, then love must be the answer. Love must find a way. I married you because if anything like this was ever going to happen, I wanted it to happen with you. And the, the biggest lesson I learned from this experience was keep that gate closed if you're surrounded by zombies, Seriously, right? Do not yeah. let them in. Uh, I'm going to answer the second question that we have up on the screen first. Why do we do live QA? Because it is exhilarating because you never know what's going to happen. So we just saw that the playback was a little bit stuttery on yeah, that. Yeah, it's not what the, that yeah. stutter is not what the film yeah, looks the, like. Yeah, Z does not look like an old silent film that's been sped up. Yeah. So a uh, quick question was, why do you do live QA? We do it for the experience like this. We love talking about it, but also it constantly challenges us to fix problems before we get on a big um, live project for a client. So, you know, just a couple of months ago, we did a million view concert for Intuit up in Silicon Valley. 
but we had done a year of live before that learning lessons, right? Yeah. So that stuttery playback, okay, noting the stuttery playback of the trailer, we'll uh, debrief on it afterwards and figure out why that happened and then the next project won't happen Buggy again. Buggy premiere issue, right. whatever. And somebody told us that we had some audio delay issues. So we have an audio delay box that we put into the chain so we can actually actively adjust our audio. So that's the real answer is this whole thing is a lab every time we do this, where we get better for the next one. And there's no fix it in post. It's kind right. of fix it now. I love the segue into Zed because we were just talking about the film school of web series, all the lessons you've learned, and before you did your first big independent feature, Better Off Zed as a director and a storyteller, a writer, a producer, right. let's be clear, you had 10 years of slaving through every short web series, et cetera. So what did you learn and how did you apply it to Zed? Well, you know, it's establishing that goal. Like, what flag are you planting and how are you rallying your people, right? And then it's bringing the, all the lessons to bear. So, so wanting to move out of kind of the web se series world or the client service world and into kind of a feature world has always been the dream, sure. right? And so knowing that's a goal set. And then starting to intelligently bring those lessons that are so important right to what you have. Which was a house. You knew you could own we your own house. We had the location. What's an interesting story that we can do? right to the scale that you can, listen, if you cannot afford to make in the way that you want it to look, dinosaurs, robot dinosaurs to fly around the moon, you know, don't write that unless you want to just, you know, monofilament string a uh, moon and like dinosaurs <laughs> flying around. But if you want to look like- I would watch that story, yeah, by the way, for those, if, I want the dinosaurs around the moon story. <laughs> but if yeah. you want it to look like the Transformers, but you don't have a CGI budget, right. don't write that because so it's you, not gonna look that way. So you knew you could tell a compelling relationship drama. Yep. Um, and interestingly, you chose the zombie apocalypse, but you didn't show it in the way I think people may think about you that. You know, uh, and then it's, 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 how do you keep the stories fresh? How do you look at like what's being done and twist it, refabricate it, change it to what you need. And a lot of times that interestingly enough is dictated by the sandbox that you can play in. So identifying the boundaries of your sandbox and then getting as creative as you possibly can, throwing the kitchen sink in there, finding what relationships, who's on board, who's saying yes to you, you know, find those things and then plan, prep, murder yourself on prep. My God, the prep that went into this. You know, it's interesting. I think probably the average number of years you've been working with anybody on that set had to be three. I don't think you- The lowest number. The lowest number, probably average of five years. So this was, you pulled out all the stops, all the, all stops. the cards, cashed in the chips, brought it together. Yeah. Um, I think this is something both you and I can answer. What are some of the first steps after you decide to make a project? I want to, if anybody has this idea out there that we're still in a time where you can come up with an idea and pitch it, that time is over. Over, dead. Unless you're J.J. Abrams or Steven Spielberg and a studio will cough up money on you the moment yeah. you say you want to make something, you have to have a finished script. Yeah. You, because it's cheap to do, like it's just your time. So interestingly, you didn't start talking about Zed until you had a finished script. No. And, and so that's, I, I want to make sure that we level set on what a first, like the first step after you have a completely finished script. So, um, and that's something I love about what, what you did. What was the first step then for you once you had that finished script? Well, I mean, it's interesting because we actually backed into that script from, from really the location. I mean, when you're shooting in LA, the hardest thing to get your hands on is a location that you own. That you don't have to pack up that every single day. you do not have to pack up every single day. And what that does is maximizes your creative time, right? Mm. And so what do you own? And then from there, it was minimizing the number of people, the number of moving parts that were in there, and then finding an interesting story. So from there, we found that interest story, interesting story. I worked with an amazing writer named Amy Tofty. She and I went back and forth. A lot of the drafts that we went through, and she was exhaustive on, on her drafts for me, was pushing back on, like, we can't, we can't do that on this. We, we can't afford to do that. We can't afford to do that. And so it was this constant push pull of the creative and the producer, creative and the producer. So we had the th we had the script, and then it was like the moment of decision. Was, oddly enough, we're gonna do this, and 
simply it's the choice that it's happening. You have the script, you understand the creative. The next step is, is really setting that date. Set that date and make that become as real as humanly possible. That date does not move, life happens. Everybody that you talk to that's gonna be part of your creative process is gonna have bogeys come in that they knew nothing about. Right. You're gonna have them from yourself. That date does not move. It, that date needs to be coming at you like, sure. a, like a juggernaut, like a, like a freight train. I'll give, I mean, we, you and I could talk on our respective projects and do a whole show on each one. I'll say real quickly for mine, the one that um, is my first studio cell, but it's for web streaming release. Okay. Uh, the first step for me after I wrote the script was saying, I'm now going to have to convince somebody to take a look at this and believe in it. So I worked with an amazing storyboard artist named Ben Firth, who took 12 flash frames from the script. Just moments. Moments that I thought would be the most compelling if I told the story to somebody else. So those color boards became the thing that I put a presentation together with our amazing uh, chief creative officer, Jason Milligan, who also did Go Get Outside. And I said, Jason, help me tell a compelling story. And so when I went down and I sat with the studio, it was doing those 12 frames and taking those cool moments and stringing them together and saying, this is the piece. So here we have a divergent path, which is, are you doing this yourself? Right. Or are you trying to sell it in somewhere to get other people on board with you? Right. And so it's either what are you creating to help you sell it? Or, or what are you creating to help you shoot it? Yeah, or what are you building mechanics wise to make it real? Copy and that. Those are the two things. And so from there, you know, next question from Meg Carraway is have you guys ever crowdfunded before, or been involved in a campaign before? Any great question, there? Meg. Yeah, great question. Because that's reality right now. Right. And the answer is, is all too often we have not. Shelf Life, though, did a huge crowdfunding campaign. And it funded season four. It funded season four. If Yuri and Tara were here, though, I would say double the effort you think a crowdfunding campaign is going to take from the amount of work it takes to outreach, yeah. to doing meaningful incentives, to then fulfilling those incentives. Yeah. The, it, truly, the, the crowdsourcing campaign becomes the project. Right, and it here becomes is, a project. Here is what most people learn about crowdfunding. <laughs> it is a way for people who already want to fund you to easily fund you. What you're going to find if it's a first project or a second project is it's going to be every relative of every person who's involved with the production and any of your friends who are lucky enough to have money, you're going to broadcast it out then they're gonna say, hey, I've always wanted to give Meg a shot. Here's $100 for Meg. I can scrape that, out, that up out of my Starbucks money this month, right? Whoever that mechanism is, that's the brutal truth about crowdfunding an original project if you don't already have a name. So do it, but just go on eyes wide open mm -hmm. on that. Um, I think that after a certain point, unless you're lucky enough to own some source material that everyone wants, or you have a big name brand actor who wants to do something that none of the studios want, so they want to get it funded, that the truth is after a certain threshold, you got to sell the project to somebody who's willing to fund it. Right. Crowdfunding is only going to take you so far. Yeah, only so far. Uh, so another question that's out there, uh, Minty Pineapple, is there any way for one to work for Butcher Bird? If so, what are you looking for? And uh, the hustle follows up with, uh, can what are you looking for be me? If not, come, come, on, on. come on, man. <laughs> this is a great question. And this is actually a question of, how do you get started with anybody, anybody. in Hollywood? Yeah, how do you break in? Uh, and so I get asked this question actually from time to time, and I can give a specific story uh, about uh, Sarah. Not gonna say Sarah's last name, Sarah's a real person. So I met Sarah uh, through my wife's dog sitting business. And Sarah was a recent graduate from USC Film School, uh, getting her master's in cinematography. She wants to be a DP, wants to do stuff. And Sarah is a very competent person, uh, like her personality, and she's just getting started. And so, listen, we're all looking for career progression. We all wanna be directors and writers and a-list movie stars and whatever. I understand shooting for the moon, but what is the path 
for that. And so when I was talking to Sarah about kind of getting started, she didn't come to me going, hey, I want to DP your next feature film. Uh, how, do, how do I DP I your did, next feature film? It wasn't that conversation. It was very specific on, I understand that I need to break in. How do I second AC for you? Are there people that you can introduce me to? That becomes a very actionable thing. I can very easily get somebody started down the road of what? Relationship building. Right, and, and I would- How do you build relationships? How do you build relationships? Here, let's just cut, cut to the chase on what we're looking for when we first work with somebody. We're not looking for your ability to compose a great image. We're not looking for your ability to sing an aria on camera. We are looking for your base dependability. Yeah, it's so simple. <laughs> and, and, and here is the startling truth. Travis and I, either in the last two weeks or the next two weeks, we'll find ourselves cleaning the stage toilets. Even though we're both directing, we both have features, et cetera, because it's our stage and we will roll up our sleeves and clean when we need to. Get the work done. Get the work done. At the same time that we may be on a set a week later with 100 people on it, our particular brand is everybody rolls up their sleeves. Yeah. So the first and, thing and that the we're looking for- And the people that I know that have been successful are also, also those, those people. people. And those are the people that I have relationships with, the so, Linda Morels of the world that are out there that yes. do the work. Right, and you know every single person on this team back there who's on what we call the dark side behind the scenes, they've done that too. Yeah. And that's an ethos we're looking for. So one, how do you get started with us or somebody like us? It's that you're showing that you're willing to show that you're dependable. Yeah. And there are two paths to that. One is um, to get involved as an intern on one of our non-funded volunteer projects uh, that you are just starting on, let me be a PA today and show that it's real. Um, and if, it's, if you're looking for those opportunities, it can be as easy as starting with Craigslist and looking for films going up where they need a PA. Yeah. You wanna meet as many people in town as fast as you can, because then people can cross verify that you're a real person and that you have real passion and that you're dependable. Uh, for specific, for Butcher Bird, it's as easy as emailing in after this Ask Me Anything and saying, hey, here's my resume. I'd love a chance to get started with you guys. And then we have a pile and we say, okay, who's, who's in the want to get started pile? We've got an insane, weird project happening where it's all hands on deck. Let's throw that out there and see if they're available. It, it's just that easy. And then the kind of segue uh, follow-up is how do you transition from people from doing projects for fun or doing projects under the same umbrella, but to actually prove something or move forward with your career, the transition can also be complicated. Yep. And again, uh, trust building and relationships. And so, listen, we all hear the stories about the gatekeepers, right? The people that like are, you know, telling people no, or you need to be able to do this. and you rebel against that and you start looking for your yeses. It's great to be able to move into an organization that has structure and mentorship that are giving people opportunities, you know, and- Which means you should look for those organizations. You need to look for them. You need to look for the people that are saying yes, that are looking for the mentorship or that individual. And listen, those individuals are few and far between, but they are out there. Look to see who your champion is. Look to see who believes in your, your kind of career traje trajectory and help give them the things that they need in order to keep saying yes to you. How do you transition? Uh, answering in terms of Butcher Bird, I'll demystify the process a little bit. We're looking for somebody who's done three or four or five projects with us. Yeah. And then, and, and, and brought it at whatever level and whatever position. And then what we're looking for is to really help make your dreams come true. So Griffin, who you met behind the scenes at the beginning of the show, he is a fresh grad as of last year from UCSB, yep. right? And one of the first things that we did, and we sat down with him and he said, look, the expectation is your source was apprentice right now. And you're gonna have to mop and do all the learning and all the other stuff, but you need to be working on your own scripts as well. Yeah. And then lo and behold, within six months, Griffin said, hey, I want to take my comedy troupe and start shooting some things on the stage. Is, is that okay? And we said, by all means. 
But that didn't come lightly. We knew that Griffin would treat everything as precious as if he owned it. Right. He had already brought it. He had shown that he was dedicated. Uh, Daniel Gomez, one of our favorite people, right. um, he had actually done work with us for a couple of years on projects large and small, never batting an eyelash at whatever craziness that we got involved in. And he reached out to you recently and wanted to film a music video on stage? Uh, he wanted to mu film his music video. We supported that. And then I actually reached out to him recently uh, for him to direct something because, you know, just like the rest of us, he's working his way through the industry. And listen, this industry is really crazy where it's conservative in the manner that people that meet you as something love to just lock you in that box. I meet right. you as a grip. I meet You're you a as grip a grip for the rest of your life. And yeah. that's all they hire you. You need to get away from those people. And But at the same time, you have to work really hard to prove that you're not just in this position. Yeah. So Daniel started sharing his reel with us about these beautiful things he'd done with Nick Novotny, who yeah. used to be a second AC and then a first AC. Yeah. I, we could talk about this a long time, but I think what you're seeing here is that there's a virtuous circle. Yeah. And that, that your price of admission to that virtuous circle is, I'm going to work harder than I ever have in my life supporting the people to my right and left to make productions. Yep. And then pretty quickly on, I'm gonna ask for some help. Yep. And that, that's as mysterious as it gets. That, that is the answer yeah, that I've seen. They're adding their life energy into our circle and we're giving it back to them, you know? So, and listen, there's only so many kind of creative projects that you can helm at one time. There is, there's a finite amount of you to spit around. Yeah. But the people that you're surrounding yourself with should also be doing the same things. You want to be working with people that are saying yes, that are creating their own things. So those are the people that you, finishers, people that are finishing the product projects that you do. And then it becomes very easy to like, listen, I know you have all this stuff. This is what I could commit to. I can say yes to this. And that's where, you know, when I was talking about, don't be afraid to say no, because you don't want to let your friends down, but don't be afraid to say yes to very specific things. And it's like, <laughs> it's the smallest things. One time, Linda, for Better Off Zed, in a limited capacity, she just handled parking for us. Where is the crew going to park? And I got to tell you. That was your mentor giving back to you. It was the straw that was breaking the camel's back on my producing of that project and her just handling that very simple thing for me was life-changing. I should like hang I a lantern to cry. <laughs> I should hang a lantern on something there is uh, if, if you wanted a maxim to go by, you're always auditioning. You're always auditioning for the next film you're going to be a part of with your friends. You're always yeah. auditioning for the next position you want. You auditioned for years for Linda without ever thinking about it. Sure. And then you recently did a broadcast piece for her. She's yeah. an Emmy winning producer and you proved yourself. I started PAing for her. That's how I, I met her by being her PA. Right. And, and this is something that, that you should absolutely know if you're not in Hollywood and are coming here now. It's not just, hey, how do you get ahead? It is the person who gives you that shot is staking their career and reputation on you. Yeah. So that's a really, that's, that's an awe-inspiring currency if you think about it. And the whole reason you're proving yourself is because somebody's career is on the line. Yeah, that trust build is happening from moment one. And, you know, anytime somebody hires you, and that's why, like, that's how you get hired out in, in Hollywood more often than not is right. you get that kind of godfather handoff of hey, this is my person, treat them well, and they'll treat you well. You know, you can right. trust them. Jared, and, how, how many questions do we have time for now? Um, I was going to say start wrapping it up. Okay, do we have time for one more? Let's let, let Lillian select her favorite question of the remaining ones. Oh, boy. Uh, Peter, while, she, while she's doing that, one yeah. of the ones that I saw just now was, how do you avoid becoming exhausted it, What's funny is Peter Kragowski, <laughs> who asked that, is a editorial mentor from the start of my career. Oh, funny. Yeah, and so I, I, I am <laughs> grinning because Peter and I have, have pulled all-nighters for projects. Uh, no, you don't. <laughs> I, you don't, and so coffee. you have the coffee. Yeah, thank you, Jared. Uh, somebody else who started off bottom wrong and is now directing this show. Um, I would say to Peter what I have learned is that you have to make, 
maintain maximum life balance before the project starts. That's the only thing I figured out is that like you will see me doing my best, most regular running and working out and eating right before a project starts. Yeah. Cause I know once the project is going, then it's gonna be nuts for that, that yeah. period. So weirdly, yeah. you have to work that much harder to take care of yourself before projects. And that's the, the other reason to keep doing projects that even aren't funded, whatever. You need to find what your work tempo is. You need to find what your envelope right. is of right. what's possible for you. And you can't find that breaking point unless you're doing it. And that's a really, really, really important lesson to learn. You're not just learning the job, you're learning yourself. And then finding the difference between this is a one day shoot and what's the burnout level for that versus this is a three week shoot and how do I create that operational tempo where I can get to the end of that three week shoot sure. in a meaningful way before I hit my breaking point and become sick or crash or want to murder somebody or whatever that breaking point is emotionally for you or physically or whatever. And that's why you do the projects. Yes. Big and small. Yes. Never say no. I went through years of my career where if somebody asked me to help them, I said yes, no matter what the cost. needed the experience. And no matter what I was doing, I wanted to learn every aspect. Hey, I need a grip. Do you know how to grip? No, but I'm reasonably I'm, intelligent. And if it, you have I'll somebody that's, that's willing to kind of help me out, I will learn the lefty loosey righty tidy rule and I will learn, you know, what a C stand is. Sure. I'll, I'll learn all that stuff. Uh, I see Lillian has brought up one and this is about um, how do you, if you are working with somebody who's a friend, how do you let them go and still maintain your friendship? I'd love to do one more really positive question to end on, but let's answer this real quick. Here it is. You have to communicate as honestly and directly to your friend as you can. And I've had to have the conversation and it goes like this. Max, Maxine, I really value my friendship with you, but this is not a good fit. We're in a situation now where this just isn't a good fit for either of us. So let's wrap it up today. Let's grab coffee next week. And, and let's move on. And, and if, there, if there really is that friendship that you're talking about there, it's gonna be okay. But the hard thing is being brave enough to have that conversation. Yeah. It's, <clears throat> for me, because I've actually had the conversation as well, it's, f for me, and this is absolute truth, I value friendships above all. They are the true lifeblood. It's the only thing that continues. It continues. <laughs> Projects come and go, and right. that's like, you will find a way through that. And sometimes this conversation doesn't come during the middle of the project. You gotta like befuddle your way through it, figure it out, you'll find a way to do it, and then just address it and be like, listen, you know, listen, my friendship with you is the most important thing. And so Thanks, rather, Travis. rather than have, you walk away this with the ill feelings or me walk away. Yeah, it's it's not that right or wrong and I'm not looking for like blame game. I never get into anything. It's obviously something about this is bothering you. Something about this is bothering me. Let's just call it for what it is and know that I value you more than anything else. And that's, that's Clear where we're working from. Yeah, 100%. So we'll finish out on this question, Jared. And not uh, that that wasn't positive, I guess, because. You right. Know, I mean, that is that is positive. Yeah, because you want to maintain a friendship. And, 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 and amazingly enough, sometimes it's just not working with that friend in that specific capacity. Sure. Because often I've had those conversations where we did end up working again, just in some other way. Different role. Yeah. Different roles. So uh, Jamie, who we started with, um, asks, how involved are you in the marketing of projects you make or are hired on? Do you have any advice about maximizing our efforts without losing our minds all the rest of our free time? So um, let's, let's hit this as a marketing response. I will say in general, if we are being hired by an agency or a client, they have their own marketing departments and teams and social, and we're basically feeding them their Servicing materials. Servicing their vision. Right, so I, I'm gonna answer this in terms, of, in terms of personal projects and how you get the word out. Uh, I will say this, it is expected as filmmakers today, unless you're doing big, big studio films, that you're going to have a sense, 
you're going to need to have a sense of what is your marketing plan? What can you bring to the marketing yeah. equation? Learn what the buzzwords are, content marketing, uh, social media rollouts, right. all of those things. Have your stuff prepped and ready to go for those plans. So Brass Tax, um, Jared actually did your behind the scenes on Better Off Zed yes. and pulled together a making of documentary. So you identified the people at the beginning that you knew you needed to make those marketing stories. Yep. Find the partnerships. Find, find the, the partnerships. And then um, for my first studio project, I am actually involved at the very beginning on asking, and I'm the one who's expected to throw out some creative ideas to start with because I was the one who wrote the project and am directing it. What are the in-world marketing stunts and ancillary content that will help advance the story in a fun way that's perfect for social? Right. So um, there's a much longer conversation, I think, about how to properly get marketing about a project out there. Specifically, we're answering it in terms of what do you need to do as a creator right. on your side, no matter what, to be ready for that market. And I think stuff like this is, especially for young filmmakers or young web series people, as important as the series itself because as a business, right? Because this is show business. You need to be able to figure out how to earn a living doing this stuff. More often than the creative project, you're going to be doing this kind of content for people. People are going to be spending money, money with you to create this stuff. And I know this specifically because we just did uh, the broadcast social media and digital platform stuff uh, promos for uh, the teachers series. With Linda. With, uh, with Linda. So we got hired in and in a two day insanity fest, we created everything from little shareable memes uh, to you know Instagram posts to full broadcast commercials and and, and also their print ads their their still photography in two days on like a full on 48 hour sprint but it's the exact same conversation isn't it because even though this is Viacom even though it's a major network television yeah. play they are at the very beginning before the season begins, they're asking how they can create in character, in world marketing materials. Yep. And you ended up working with the writers team. You ended up working with the Katie's, all the actresses. So even though it was this really big show with a lot of planning, it was still fundamentally the same work and, as you're doing on Zed now, for instance. And going in and building the trust relationships with those people, it's easier to build those trust relationships if you have specific material that you can point to that's not out in the ether of like, hey, I got amazing ideas, more than, hey, look at this specific thing right. that I think you will notice is exactly of what you're asking for, content marketing, you know, digital social media rollout, all those things. If you're doing that for yourself, you're also demonstrating, so you're gonna benefit from your work, but you're also demonstrating to others that you can do work like this, and that's, that's a revenue stream. That's what people are hiring people like us to go out and do, you know, and, and it's, it's part of the game. It's, Amen. It's, it's part of the environment. We're getting the um, um, kill it or be killed. Yeah. I think that's what the message from Jared is right now. So uh, I want to say a personal thank you to our entire uh, Sterable audience. Uh, it means so much to us that you reached out and asked us questions. As you can tell, we really, really cherish the opportunity to try to share some of the hard-earned lessons with you folks. And just so you guys know, we do this uh, every two weeks now, really, at Butcher Bird Presents, where we get on camera live with uh, digital content creators, people that are working within the digital community, um, directors, producers, writers, actors. artists, actors, anybody that's kind of doing interesting things and having these kind of conversations. So even though this AMA is wrapping up, don't be afraid to reach out to us via uh, Info at ButcherBirdStudios.com, uh, via our Facebook or yeah, like us on Facebook, Instagram follow us. accounts, uh, you know, and f find out if you're here in LA based or you're coming out, you know, we're an inclusive community and we will bring you in. We will talk to you if we have time, if there's whatever, if, you know, the stars align, we're not afraid. We're not afraid to reach out to our community and, and interact at all. And let us know what you're working on. Um, we want to see you pushing the envelope, not asking permission, getting your ideas out there, and we want to be inspired by you. So yeah, definitely absolutely. reach back and uh, share your work with us in the future. 
So uh, that's a big goodbye from uh, Travis Stevens. Steven Calco. And Butcherbird Studios, Butcherbird Presents, Sterable.com. Thank you guys for uh, tuning in. See you soon.